The Fourier transform is a widely used tool in all of science and engineering. We're going to look at it specifically for signal processing. Now, the Fourier transform is used to analyze signals and systems in both continuous and discrete time. It's primarily derived for the case of continuous time non-periodic signals. However, if we use things like impulses, we can extend the Fourier transform to discrete time signals and to periodic signals. Now the definition of the Fourier transform is shown in these two equations here. I have a signal x of t and I'm going to express that as the integral of the Fourier transform of x of t, which is x of omega, times e to the j omega t d omega. And we're integrating from minus infinity to infinity. Now x of omega is obtained from x of t. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship here between x of t and x of omega. And we see that x of omega is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of t e to the minus j omega t dt. So they are inverses, and it's a one-to-one -one relationship, and we'll use a notation, a double arrow here, with an FT to denote Fourier transform to indicate that these two signals are a Fourier transform pair. Now for interpretation, we're going to take this integral expression for x of t and write it more as a Riemann sum. In other words, recognize the, that the integral is just a fancy summation, and if we do that, we can see that we're expressing the signal x of t as a weighted sum of sinusoids. So our weights are the samples of the Fourier transform times the delta omega, which is our surrogate for d omega. And then we're normalizing by 2 pi because this is out here. And then we're multiplying that times a complex sinusoid, e to the j, at that particular frequency, omega i times t. And we do this over the entire range of frequencies from minus infinity to infinity. So we're saying that our signal x of t can be described as a sum of sinusoids with weights that are determined by this Fourier transform relationship. Now the integrals in the Fourier transform are infinite, minus infinity to infinity, and both the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform, which is this expression for x of t, this form is often called the inverse Fourier transform, and this form is called the Fourier transform. But because of this fact that we're integrating from minus infinity to infinity, these integrals only converge for certain classes of signals. For example, signals that are absolutely integrable. So if x of t if I could integrate the absolute value of x of t and obtain a finite number, then I could obtain the Fourier transform relationship. But we're not going to worry about convergence too much. You can look at discussions of convergence in textbooks and things. For signal processing, it's oftentimes not that much of an issue, other than being aware that you can't always evaluate these integrals. We're going to do some examples. I'm going to start with a signal that's a decaying exponential. So I've got x of t is going to be e to the minus at times u of t. So this signal is off until time 0 because of the step function u of t. And then it takes over e to the minus at with that decaying exponential shape. And the fact that it's decaying implies that a has to be greater than 0. Now if we substitute this expression for x of t into the definition of x of omega, in other words, we're going to find x of omega, the Fourier transform, from the time signal x of t. We find that we only need to integrate from 0 to infinity because of the step function makes everything 0 for negative time. And we combine the powers of the exponents. We see that we're integrating an exponential. We just end up with 1 over the power in the exponent times the exponent itself. So we've got negative 1 over a plus j omega times e to the minus quantity a plus j omega quantity t. We're going to evaluate that at infinity and 0. Well, at infinity, because a is positive, this goes to 0. And at 0, it becomes 1. So we end up with our Fourier transform pair is that x omega is simply 1 over a plus j omega. So this is a complex quantity. If I take the magnitude, it's just going to be 1 over the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary parts 
square root. And I can graph that as omega gets big relative to a. This is going to go down kind of like 1 over omega. So you've got this 1 over omega decay for both positive and negative frequencies. And then at omega equals 0, of course, I get 1 over a. And when omega is equal to a, I get 1 over a times the square root of 2, as I sketched here. So this graph just kind of falls off in both directions. Now the phase, which we'll denote as the argument of x of omega, is just the arctangent, negative arctangent of the imaginary divided by the real. And that's going to have an arctangent shape, where at a, when omega is equal to a, I get negative pi over 4. When omega is equal to minus a, I get pi over 4. And then these asymptote out to negative pi over 2 or plus pi over 2. The next two examples, the first of which is a rectangular pulse. I'm going to define a signal x of t, which is 1 when t is between minus t naught and t naught, and it's 0 outside of that range. And we're going to find the Fourier transform of this rectangular signal. I can substitute into the definition for the Fourier transform, and I'm only now integrating from minus t naught to t naught because it's zero outside of this interval. When I evaluate this integral for omega equals zero, this is just the integral of one from minus t naught to t naught, and that of course is two t naught. When omega is not equal to zero, to get one over j omega, e to the minus j omega t evaluated at t naught and minus t naught. And this is just a sine function. I've got a j in the denominator. I've got a difference here, e to the minus j, e to the j. So I can rewrite this as x of omega is equal to 2 sine of omega t naught divided by omega. Now we're not going to make a distinction for the special case when omega equals 0 because in this form, if you take the limit as omega equals 0, you end up with 2 t naught. The omega equals zero case is obtained as a limit. Of course, the sign in the numerator is going to oscillate between plus or minus one, and in the denominator, things just get bigger. So I've got this oscillating function here where the amplitude of the oscillations are decaying as one over omega, and their zero crossing occur at the zeros of the sine function, and those are going to be at pi over t naught, two pi over t naught, three pi over t naught, and so on. And then the maximum value at omega equals 0 will be 2t0. So here you can clearly see that there's an inverse relationship between the width of the signal in time domain and its Fourier transform. If I make t0 bigger, in other words, I make the time domain signal wider, the frequency domain version, x of omega, is going to get narrower because the width of this main section here is inversely related to t naught. Of course, the opposite happens as well. If I shrink t naught and make this narrower, the Fourier transform will get broader because so there's an inverse relationship between time and frequency, and that's a principle that applies universally. We'll also see it in the next case. So now let's go the other way. We've been taking signals in the time domain and finding their Fourier transform, Let's take a signal in the frequency domain and find the inverse Fourier transform. In other words, what's the time domain signal? So here I have a rectangular spectrum. X omega is 1 between minus w and w and 0 elsewhere. So if we apply the definition for the inverse Fourier transform to find x of t from this x of omega, we see that we're just going to integrate from minus w to w e to the j omega t d omega. And if t is not equal to 0, I can write this as 1 over 2 pi. And then I've got the jt from the integration, e to the j omega t, evaluated at w and minus w. And as before, this ends up looking like a sine function. So I end up with 1 over pi t sine of wt when t is not equal to 0. And if I reevaluate this integral when t is equal to 0, then I'm just integrating 1 from minus w to w, and I get w over pi. We're going to write this, the time domain signal, x of t, as sine of wt over pi t. And we're not going to differentiate the special case of t equals 0, because if I take the limit of this function at t equals 0, I get w over pi. So it gives us the right answer.
So we're going to write and assume that in the case of t equals 0, we're evaluating the limit. And it keeps our notation a bit simpler. So as before, we have this oscillating function. It oscillates because the sine oscillates in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have a t. So we're going to have a decaying amplitude as t increases. The zero crossings of this function are determined by the zero crossings of the sine. And those occur at plus or minus pi over w, plus or minus 2 pi over w, 3 pi over w, and so on. And then the amplitude at zero is w over pi, which is the maximum. We see the same phenomena that we did with the rectangular pulse. That is, if I make the bandwidth or the width of this signal in the frequency domain wider, as I increase w, my signal is going to get narrower in the time domain and vice versa. The other thing that's kind of interesting is in the previous example, we had a rectangle in the time domain, and we've got this uh, sine x over x shape, which is something that's usually referred to as a sync function. So we got a sync function in frequency. So we had rectangular in time Fourier transform to sync in frequency. Well, here we found that a sync in time has a Fourier transform, which is a rectangle in frequency. So there's a certain symmetry between time and frequency. Now I want to consider the Fourier transform of an impulse. And this is useful as a mathematical tool. Impulses, of course, are not signals that we can physically generate or see in nature. They do approximate large amplitude short duration signals for us. But if I take x of t to be delta of t, as I've done here, and I substitute that into the expression for the Fourier transform and use the sifting property of the impulse, which means basically I'm going to evaluate this function at the time at which the impulse occurs, and that gives me the answer to the integral, I get e to the minus j omega t at t equals 0 is just 1. So x omega is 1. We see that we have sort of the ultimate of a narrow signal in time, and it gives us the ultimate of a wide signal in frequency. Now we can also do the other case where I have a impulse in frequency. In other words, all my energy is concentrated at 0, and find out what time signal this corresponds to. Again, substituting the expression for the impulse into the inverse Fourier transform, we again have an integral of an impulse times another function, and the sifting property says we evaluate this function at the frequency, in this case, at which the impulse is located. So putting in omega 0, we find we get 1 for the integral, and therefore we have this 1 over 2 pi, so we have 1 over 2 pi for x of t. So in this case, we have the ultimate of a signal which is narrow in frequency, and we get the ultimate wide signal in time. And we have also that same duality property we saw with the rectangles and the sinks, where the impulse in time corresponds to a constant in frequency, and a constant in time corresponds to an impulse in frequency. This is an example where you're playing with the edge of our ability to work with Fourier transforms in terms of convergence. Because if I asked you to take the inverse Fourier transform of this signal, x of omega, you had to integrate from minus infinity to infinity e to the j omega t d omega, that integral doesn't converge. And the same thing if I asked you to take the Fourier transform of x of t down here, the constant function, Similarly, that integral won't converge. So whenever you see impulses floating around in Fourier transforms, you're right on the edge of, of things working. We use this as a Fourier transform pair because we can go at least one way, and it works out actually quite nicely with some of the mathematics. So Fourier transforms are extremely useful as an analysis tool and they allow us to understand certain things about signals, and we'll develop that more fully as we proceed in our journey.